Good morning. This is Ron. It is Saturday, February the 17th. Welcome to Storytime. And uh, today and tomorrow, I'm going to be reading from another book by Ayn Rand. Uh, This one's called Philosophy, Who Needs It? And today I'm going to be reading The Introduction. Ayn Rand was not only a novelist and philosopher, she was also a salesman of philosophy, the greatest salesman philosophy has ever had. Who else could write a romantic bestseller such as Atlas Shrugged, in which the heroes and the villains are differentiated fundamentally by their metaphysics, in which the wrong epistemology is shown to lead to train wrecks, furnace breakouts, and sexual impotence, in which the right ethics is shown to be the indispensable means to the rebuilding of New York City and of man's soul. Who else could write a book called Philosophy, Who Needs It, and have an answer to offer? Ayn Rand's power to sell philosophy is a consequence of her particular philosophy, objectivism. I am not primarily an advocate of capitalism, but of egoism, she wrote a decade ago. And I am not primarily an advocate of egoism, but of reason. If one recognizes the supremacy of reason and applies it consistently, the rest, all the rest follows. This, the supremacy of reason, was, is, and will be the primary concern of my work and the essence of objectivism. And that's from the Objectivist, September 1971. Reason, according to objectivism, is not merely a distinguishable attribute of man, it is his fundamental attribute, his basic means of survival. Therefore, whatever reason requires in order to function is a necessity of human life. Reason functions by integrating perceptual data into concepts. This process, Ayn Rand holds, ultimately requires the widest integrations, those which give man knowledge of the universe in which he acts of his means of knowledge, and of his proper values. Man, therefore, needs metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, i.e., he needs philosophy. He needs it by his essential nature and for a practical purpose, in order to be able to think, to act, to live. In today's world, this view of the role of philosophy is unique, just as in today's neo-mystic culture, Objectivism's advocacy of reason is all but unique. To Ayn Rand, philosophy is not a senseless parade of abstractions created to fill out the ritual at a cocktail party or in Sunday morning services. It is not a ponderous continental wail of uh, futility resonating with oriental overtones. It is not a chess game divorced from reality designed by British professors for otherwise unemployable colleagues. To Ayn Rand, philosophy is the fundamental factor in a human life. It is the basic force that shapes the mind and character of men and the destiny of nations. It shapes them for good or for evil, depending on the kind of philosophy men accept. A man's choice, according to Ayn Rand, is not whether to have a philosophy, but only which philosophy to have. His choice is whether his philosophy will be conscious, explicit, logical, and therefore practical, or random, unidentified, contradictory, and therefore lethal. In these essays, Ayn Rand explains some of the steps necessary to achieve a conscious, rational philosophy. She teaches the reader how to identify and then evaluate the hidden premises at work in his own soul or nation. She makes clear the mechanisms by which philosophy rules men and societies, the forms that abstract theory takes in daily life, and the profound existential consequences that flow from even the most abstruse ideas. Ideas which may seem at first glance to be of merely academic concern. She shows that when an idea is rational, its consequence ultimately is the preservation of man's life, and that when an idea is irrational, its its consequence is the opposite. Contrary to the injunction issued to men for millennia, Ayn Rand did not equate objectivity with disinterest. She was interested in philosophy, in the objectivist sense of self-interest. She wanted, selfishly, for the sake of her own actions and life, 
to know which ideas are right. If man needs philosophy, she held, he needs one that is true, i.e. in accordance with reality. Philosophy, who needs it, is the last work planned by Ayn Rand before her death in March of this year. The book was first suggested by a Canadian objectivist, Walter Hoogscher. In the fall of 1981, he wrote to Miss Rand, quote, In your articles, you detail dramatically how everyone, through each statement he makes, uses philosophical premises. If such articles were published in a single volume, I believe that it would focus direct attention on philosophy's powerful influence, identify the philosophical roots of some of today's most dangerous trends, and indicate that it is possible to reverse a cultural trend that everyone can and should get involved in doing just that. Unquote. Miss Rand was pleased with Mr. Hubscher's idea of a collection taken largely from her newsletter, the Ayn Rand Letter, and featuring as its title piece one of her favorites among her own articles, quote, philosophy who needs it, unquote. Originally a speech given at the United States Military Academy at West Point. In subsequent months, with her publisher at Bob's Merrill, Grace Shaw, and with friends and associates, she several times discussed her concept of the book. She indicated its content and structure in general terms. She mentioned articles whose inclusions would be mandatory, and others that she regarded as optional. She did not live long enough, however, to determine the final selection of pieces or their sequence. It has fallen to me to make these decisions, guided, wherever possible, by Miss Rand's stated wishes. Following her policy in other anthologies, I have placed the more theoretical articles in the first part of the book, and followed them by more concrete applications and or essentially critical articles. None of the pieces have been published before in book form. The title article is followed by one written originally as its companion piece. Next comes a group dealing with the objectivist philosophy, the first of these, Chapter 3, her analysis of what is or is not open to change, represents Ayn Rand's fullest discussion in print of one element of the objectivist metaphysics, the primacy of existence. The following discussion of the anti-conceptual mentality, Chapters 4 and 5, are a demonstration in reverse of one element of the objectivist epistemology. They show what happens to men who never fully develop the human form of knowledge, concepts. The open letter to Boris Spassky, Chapter 6, The Soviet Chess Master, is a tour de force summarizing in the form of a single startling example the role in man's life of every branch of philosophy. With one exception, all the articles in this book were written between 1970 and 1975. The exception is... Faith and Force, The Destroyers of the Modern World. Chapter 7, a speech given initially at Yale University in 1960, a few years after the publication of Atlas Shrugged. This speech is an excellent, simple introduction to objectivism and to Ayn Rand's view of today's world. Until now, it has not been easily available. Those unfamiliar with Ms. Rand's work might be well advised to begin their reading with this chapter. There follows an essentially critical section, uh, chapters 8 through 13, dealing with Kant and with some of his heirs, such as the egalitarian movement and B.F. Skinner. Miss Rand was frequently asked why there are so few advocates of good ideas in positions of power today. To indicate her answer, at least in part, I have included two political pieces, chapters 14 and 15. They discuss some current methods used by the government to corrupt our cultural life. These are followed by two pieces, chapter 16 and 17, relating to another question. Ayn Rand was repeatedly asked, what can anyone do about the state of today's world? I've ended the book as I think Miss Rand would have ended it. Don't Let It Go presents the American sense of life as the basis of hope for this country's future. When articles written years apart are published in book form, editorial changes are occasionally necessary. Meanwhile, if you're about to read these essays for the first time, I envy you because of what you will have in store for you. Ayn Rand has changed many people's minds and lives. Perhaps she will change yours too. Leonard Pikoff, New York City, May 1982. 
and uh, Leonard Peikoff was her, uh, more or less her devotee, and uh, he inherited her estate, at least her intellectual estate, and she be, was uh, designated by her to be Objectivism's um, spokesman uh, when she passed away. So uh, the issue I have, the biggest issue I have with Ayn Rand is with the idea that uh, of objectivism itself. Uh, Ayn Rand, when she created objectivism, ceased to be objective. When she created her own philosophy, she ceased to be objective. She became subjective. She became a promoter of her own philosophy instead of being a promoter of the truth. You uh, contrast her with Aristotle. Aristotle was a philosopher, but he didn't have his own philosophy. He went out and was discovering what's true. And uh, he was... and. He called it philosophy, the love of wisdom. It wasn't called Aristotelianism. It wasn't called egoism. It wasn't called objectivism. It was just simply philosophy. And there's a, a section in here where she's talking about uh, people understanding which philosophies that they are uh, using. It says, but only which philosophy to have. His choice is whether his philosophy will be conscious, explicit, logical, and therefore practical or random, identified, contradictory, and therefore legal, lethal. And what she means to say is philosophical theory or theories. That makes more sense. So, um, but that's my uh, biggest gripe. I have some other issues with uh, Ayn Rand that I'll, I will deal with as um, I go along in this book. And uh, again, that was the introduction. And tomorrow I'll be reading uh, chapter one of uh, Philosophy Who Needs It. And until then, thank you very much for joining me and have a great day.